Okay, now let's think about particles with mass. So we're going to start a new flowchart. Particles with mass, especially say electrons. So again, we can kind of start at the left and we'll move to the right. So we're thinking about say a particle with mass like a baseball or an electron. Okay. Now these are the things that we normally just think of as particles. We normally think of an electron as a particle or a baseball as a particle. However, uh, again, it turns out that modern physics says there's wave particle duality. Even the things that we normally think of as particles have wave characteristics. Even an electron has wave characteristics, which means that it has a wavelength. Ah, to save space, I won't write that out. It's right there. So these particles have wavelengths. This chalk holder, say, has a wavelength. It doesn't seem like a wave, but it does have a wavelength. And an electron definitely has a wavelength. Everything's got a wavelength, because everything has wave characteristics. So, um, how do you figure out the wave characteristics? Well, they're related to the momentum. So we have to go back to this concept of momentum that we saw last semester. Do you remember what the symbol is for momentum? Lowercase p is the usual symbol for momentum. Good. Okay, so what's the relationship between momentum and wavelength? This is one of the formulas you might have missed if you missed the last couple of lectures. Here's the basic equation that relates the momentum and the wavelength. And here's our friend Planck's constant again. So this equation we should put above the arrow to show that this is the equation that lets us go between lambda and p. This is what's called the de Broglie wavelength. Uh, it doesn't look like it's pronounced de Broglie, but I think that's the right pronunciation. This was a, a French guy. I think it's pronounced de Broglie. The de Broglie wavelength, uh, he was the person who first guessed that uh, particles should have uh, a wavelength. And I think he just did it on symmetry. I, I'm not really up to date on his history, but I think he just said, well, gee, even the things that we used to think of as waves, like light, those actually could be thought of as particles. Wouldn't it be symmetrical if particles also had a wavelength? So I'm sure there was more complicated math involved there. But anyway, he was partly based on just the beauty and the symmetry, that it seems like we found wave-particle duality for light. Maybe everything has it. OK. So um, this is our de Broglie wavelength for particles with mass, like electrons or uh, other things. Uh, and now it's going to be useful if we can figure out the velocity or speed. Very good. That's one of the equations we learned last semester. Good. So you're remembering that velocity is symbol V. What are the units for velocity? Good. By the way, now that helps us remember what are the units for momentum? Go ahead and try writing down the units for momentum. Times kilograms, right. The units for mass are kilograms, and the units for velocity are meters per second. So it would be, it would be pronounced kilogram meters per second. Kilogram meters per second. There's no special name for that. Usually when we're plugging into formulas, we're not going to plug in the units for simplicity, but in our answer, we should have the right units. Uh, technically, you could also figure out the units for momentum from this equation, but that would be a pain. So we won't worry about figuring out the units from here. But here, we can get the units. Uh, also, something I should mention is uh, it turns out that this is only the classical momentum. There's a different momentum in relativity. Uh, if you're, so if you're going very fast, this formula doesn't work. 
Uh, but even though your course covered relativity, it didn't seem like you were covering momentum for relativity. We didn't talk. It was a little yeah. Yeah, so we won't worry about that. We'll just assume that we're using non-relativistic. But you might have noticed in your homework, or when you do the homework, you'll notice, sometimes they'll say the speed is much smaller than the speed of light. And that's just, they're just covering themselves to make it legal for you to use this formula. When they say the speed is less, much less than the speed of light, they're just saying that means that it's safe to use this formula for non-relativistic momentum. Uh, I don't think you'll be expected to know the formula for relativistic momentum in your course. Okay. Uh, so let's think about why we don't normally notice that things have wavelengths. So for example, again, this chalk holder has wave characteristics and has uh, a wavelength, but it doesn't seem like a wave at all. Well, why is that? Well, let's say that something has a big mass. Let's try to work out step by step. If it has a big mass, what's the effect of that on its wavelength? So it has big mass, big momentum. And then That's from this equation. If mass is big on the right, momentum should be big on the left. And then you were saying? Small wave height. So less wave height. Good. That's just from this equation, our de Broglie equation over here. If, if P is big, lambda has to be small, because of course the right-hand side is a constant, Planck's constant. So if this gets bigger, this has to get smaller. And as we've talked about previously, small wavelengths mean uh, small wave characteristics. And big wavelengths mean big wave characteristics. So you don't notice the wave characteristics of this. Of course, it doesn't seem like this has a big mass, but it has a huge mass compared to an electron, yeah. right, or an atom. So when do these wavelengths tend to be important? These tend to be important at the atomic or the subatomic scale, when things have very small masses. When things have very small masses, um, their wave characteristics become important. Um, but anything that you wouldn't see in ordinary life has a mass that's way bigger than an electron. Therefore, it has a teensy tiny wavelength that you normally wouldn't notice uh, sure. over here. So for electron, the wave characteristics are important? Yeah, for an electron, the wave characteristics are almost always important. That's right. Um, and that's the re uh, and so we really have to take into account the wave characteristics of an electron. Uh, to give you an example, um, uh, remember that last time we saw how um, if you shine light through a slit, you get interference and diffraction patterns. Uh, of course, if you threw baseballs through a slit, you wouldn't get interference and diffraction. You just get particles hitting the screen, right? Well, what about if you shoot electrons through a slit? You get interference and diffraction, just like if it was a wave. Um, and uh, even though, in many other contexts, it seems to act like a particle. So this is, again, one of the, the weird things that really doesn't match our common sense. Even though in some contexts, electrons seem like particles, um, when you put them in a, in a context where you can have interference and diffraction, you get interference and diffraction. Their wavelengths are big enough to, to get those. So, so yeah, uh, the, uh, uh, it's very important. You definitely don't get the right answers for electrons if you just think of them as particles. Whereas in ordinary life, you can always think of a chalk holder or a baseball as a particle. The wave characteristics are so tiny that they don't really matter. That's the correspondence principle again. Um, even though modern physics says that everything has a wavelength, it says that things that you would encounter in ordinary life have wavelengths that are so small that their behavior corresponds to common sense or classical physics. It's only when things are tiny that they have, have weird results. And the reason no one ever noticed that before is because people don't normally work with atoms. Okay. All right. So, uh, so it looks like you're remembering well something we said before that was very important, which is that when something has a big wavelength, its wave characteristics are very important. And when something has a small wavelength, its wave characteristics exist, but they're probably not that important. Okay, so only thing, uh, so the things that have big masses tend to have not very important wave characteristics. But atoms and electrons have small momentum, big wavelengths, which means that their wave characteristics are important. Okay. All right, that's actually a pretty common type of test question. You might see a question that says, explain, um, do, does, an, does an electron have wave characteristics? Does a baseball have wave characteristics? Part C, why, why, are, why is it important to take into account the wave characteristics of the electron, but not the baseball? And the answer would be, well, the baseball has a relatively large mass, large momentum, and a small wavelength. Okay. All right, so moving along here, we have our velocity. And let's use that to figure out the kinetic energy. So yeah, that's our kinetic energy, one half mv squared. What's the units for kinetic energy? Joules. 
because it's just a type of energy. Good. All right, and now, just as a, pro, uh, a homework tech, um, tip, when people talk about the energy of a particle, they generally mean the kinetic energy. A lot of the time, they'll talk about the energy when they, what they really mean is the kinetic energy. So you have to keep in mind, sometimes people are a little bit sloppy, and when they say energy, when they say find the energy of this electron, they really mean find the kinetic energy. Maybe because in many cases, the potential energy is zero, but anyway. All right, again, this is only for non-relativistic, but that's the only thing you're covering in this course. So we can use the non-relativistic equation since uh, you didn't cover that aspect of relativity in the course.